Have a look at this, everyone. This is the Copley Medal. It's the oldest medal in science. It's incredibly prestigious. It's given every year by the Royal Society. This one I'm holding was given in 1752 to John Pringle. It's really beautiful. But I'll tell you what, I've got another one here that's even more amazing. This one here, in its original fish skin case, was awarded to none other than Joseph Priestley. And depending on who you are and where you're from, he was kind of like the discoverer of oxygen. But what I want to show you today is if you look over here on the right hand side, you can see there's a whole bunch of scientific instruments and prisms and chemistry things. And here at the top, there's kind of a taller object with a dome at the top. And that's an air pump. This was a really big invention of the time. Everyone at the Royal Society was talking about it. Can you imagine what it would be like to see one now? Well, you don't have to imagine. You know what's coming next. It's Keith, and he's got one. Keith, this is amazing. It's a beautiful object, isn't it? Where have you been hiding this all this time? Ah, uh, this has just come back from loan uh, from Tate Britain. So you lend this to people? Yeah, so there's a very famous painting called Bird in an Air Pump by Joseph Wright of Derby. And uh, as part of an exhibition of that painting, the air pump which features in the painting was displayed next to it. Oh, that would have been fantastic. What is this first? Like, I said it was an air pump. What's it for and how does it work? is to create a vacuum. So you would have a chamber on the top of this and by turning the handle here, you would gradually evacuate the air from that chamber. You can see there's a pipe going down here to a valve just there. And the two cylinders would work in tandem as you were pumping uh, to uh, take all of the air out so you could do experiments in that environment. Francis Hawkesby, who designed this particular instrument with its two cylinders, is active in the early years of the 18th century mostly. He knew Isaac Newton and was his lab assistant, if you like, and he would perform experiments for the fellows, but very much based on things that Robert Boyle or Robert Hooke had been doing a generation earlier. So you might put a small animal in there and see what happened when the air went out. Oh. <laughs> Not good. You might put a bell in there, as Francis Hawkesby did, and once the air was out, it was very hard to, to hear the bell ringing. I can't help noticing we haven't got a dome. What's going on? We do have a dome. You've got it? Yeah. Let's get it. Let's pop it on. All right. All right. Well, that looks fragile, Keith. It is glass, yes. Is that the original or...? Probably not. The fittings would be original, but I'd be very surprised if the, the glazing had survived from the various wear and tear that it's been subjected to over the years. <laughs> you librarians are good, but you're not that good. No, well, exactly, yeah. We've got like a hook. I guess you could use that to dangle samples. So what Hawksby would do would be to put a, a strip of leather in that recess there, so nice and soft. As the air started to be sucked out, it would, it would pull down on the leather. And then the pan itself would be filled with water, which would aid the seal again. And the brass section at the front just here, that also would be full of water. In that way, you would hope to get a, a good enough seal to do your demonstrations. And you can actually see just here, there's a gauge so you could tell exactly what the atmospheric pressure within the dome was. The thing that strikes me about this object is how ornate it is, all this extra unnecessary detail. Is That's this, right, yeah. What's the reason for this? Why have they done this? Why haven't well, they just gone functional? I think it's making the point that, firstly, science is rather important, and therefore instruments shouldn't just be practical but beautiful as well. But it also tends to suggest that maybe this was a, a demonstration piece, a teaching tool, so that it was not only what was going on here that's important, but how you would present the whole experiment. It almost becomes a piece of theatre, if you like. I can almost imagine you'd have a room full of fellows of the Royal Society saying, well, you've read about what Hook and Boyle have done. Yep. Today, we're going to show you the real deal. Well, yeah, and of course, that's the point of the Joseph Wright painting. There's a gathering of people around this thing, and yes, there's a, a small bird in there. Doesn't end well for the bird. Spoilers. <laughs> so Keith, there's a handle here. No. <laughs> no that's a no-no, that one. <laughs> that's a no-no. That, that's a non-turning yeah. handle. Yeah. Oh, it seems valuable. If I come across one of these in an antique store or an auction or something, will I, will I expect to uh, get my checkbook out? Yeah, you, you would expect to have to write a very large check for something like this, maybe 100,000 pounds, something along those lines. Wow. I'll stay back. <laughs> It's super. Thanks for showing it to us. Well, look at this one here. So we got a, a little note here. It says an odd stone found in a shark at St. Helena, weighed in air, gives you a weight there, and in water. So 
little shark stone there. Well, who hasn't weighed a stone they found in Indeed, a shark? Indeed, yes, exactly right. That's not like the core work for Boyle. This is just an odd thing, and he's wanted to get it down into the notebooks, hasn't That's he? That's right, yeah. 